Good evening. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this special member event with chefs Marcus Samuelson, Adrian Cheatham, and the Whitney's Martini family curator and director of curatorial initiatives, David Breslin. Thank you all for your great support of the Whitney Museum. I recently had the pleasure of being in conversation with Marcus. We talked about his background, his amazing passion for black cuisine and black culinary creatives, and the many powerful ways in which food, art, and culture connect and help us as all connect as communities. Tonight is part two of that conversation. At this time, Marcus and Adrian will be rolling up their sleeves, breaking out the pans and preparing a meal with us. Even though we are gathering virtually, I hope we can recreate the feeling of being together at, at just as if we were at a dinner party, hanging out in the kitchen and chatting with the chefs before sharing a meal. Marcus's innovative spirit in his cul culinary endeavors have made him a beloved cultural leader in New York City and around the world. With 10 restaurants to date in New York, Marcus may be best known as the co-owner of Red Rooster Harlem. He was the youngest chef to earn a three-star review in the New York Times, has numerous James Beard Award Foundation, Foundation Awards, and wrote the best-selling memoir, Yes, Chef, in 2013, about his journey from Ethiopia to Sweden and eventually to America. The critically acclaimed cookbook, The Rise, Black Cooks and the Soul of American Food, which we discussed in our last session, was released this past fall and highlights not only the diversity of black culinary traditions in New York City and beyond, but also how black artists and chefs have connected throughout cultural realms and was named the top cookbook of 2020 by Amazon, no, no mean feat. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Marcus and his team have doubled down on their commitment to community. In partnership with the World Central Kitchen, Red Rooster Harlem has been distributing free meals to locals, essential workers, and those out of a job. And to more than 220,000 meals have been distributed. Marcus has also been working with Black Business Matter Matching Fund at, to drive visibility and crowdsource donations to Black businesses through platforms like Uber Eats. In just a few minutes, Marcus will be sharing a recipe from the rise that is inspired by Chef Adrian Cheatham. And Adrian's dish for us tonight is in turn an homage to of sorts, the Red Rooster. Adrian grew up around and in the restaurants managed by her mother in her hometown of Chicago. She attended the Institute of Culinary Education before working at Le Bernardin, where she finished her time there as executive sous chef. From Le Bernardin, she went on to work with Marcus, where she eventually became the executive chef at Red Rooster. Adrian competed on, on season 15 of Bravo's Top Chef, coming in second, and has been featured in the New York Times, Men's Journal, Epicurious, and Cherry Bomb, to name just a few publications. Adrian launched her celebrated pop-up series, Sunday Best, in 2017, and is currently working on her first cookbook. Congratulations, Adrian. Finally, I know that David Breslin is a familiar and beloved presence for Whitney members. David joined the museum in 2016 after holding curatorial positions at the Manil Drawing Institute and the Clark Institute. And before that, he was the managing manager of the studio of artist Jenny Holzer. His past projects or a selection of those past projects at the Whitney include the exhibitions Incomplete History of Protest, selections from the Whitney Collection, David Wonorovich, History Keeps Me Awake at Night, Spilling Over, Painting Color in the 1960s. And we all have a lot to look forward to because David, together with curator Adrian Edwards, are co-curating the upcoming 2022 Biennial, which we all look forward to joining. So without further ado, welcome, Marcus. Welcome, Adrian, and welcome, David. Here we go. <laughs> Cook away. Thank you so much, Adam. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was great. Um, I, I want to thank Adam and, and really thank uh, Chef Marcus and Chef Adrian for uh, taking time out to do this. I've learned a lot uh, in the preparation to, to do this talk. Um, I made myself a cocktail out of uh, the book, The Mar, and uh, was able to make the honey simple syrup at home. Um, but what's so great about the book and so great about the two of you being here is that it shows the vitality 
of black excellence and cooking in the present and in the future, but it's also rich about the vitality of the past and what has not been able to be as fully amplified. And that's the work that the two of you are doing. So just by way of, of introducing the dishes that you're, you're gonna be preparing, I wonder if you could talk a little bit also about your, your process as a curator, that's what I care about so much is about like, how do you get an idea? How's it take material sure. form? What gets junked? Um, so enough of me, Marcus, Adrian, thanks again. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's always a pleasure to be with the Whitney family and the extended um, community. And when we thought about this, for me, it was very important that Adrian is part of this because Adrian is black excellence. She's been black excellence for a long time. And when you look at someone like Adrian, you look at present and future, right? And I mean it in her work. She's done all the hours from her family kitchen and managing with her mother, but also coming to New York and working at Le Bernardin and working with us, right? Until now, starting her pop-up series, right? Which is highlighting entrepreneurship and a new way of starting restaurants until her book that we're all very excited about. So when I was curating the rise and we're thinking about which stories to amplify and talk about, I mean, Adrian was very, very important for me to have in the book. And the recipe had to, for me, do a look back about her past, her time she spent in Le Bernardin, but also her, her past as a, a, a ballerina, as a dancer. And there's a precision about being a chef at a very high end, but also a precision about being a, a, a dancer, the hours you put in, the work. And I think that uh, New York Times did an incredible piece about Adrian, the visual piece about Adrian, where you can see both her work in the kitchen, but also her work with her uh, as a dancer. So, yeah, I'm going to do a simple salt cured salmon with a, a salad that is very eclectic, that's radishes and cucumbers that's bright. And then I'm gonna do a, a little roasted carrot uh, broth with that. So it's light, it's delicious, and it's very elegant, just like Adrian. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chef. That is, that is an incredible honor to hear you say all that. And I really appreciate it. And you've always been a, a champion of different chefs that work for you, especially chefs of color. Um, Marcus has kind of found a way to bring together chefs of color from all over different restaurants and different backgrounds, uh, fine dining, casual, but you have to have that work ethic, you have to have that appreciation for one another and the camaraderie. Um, and that was kind of the home that I found with Marcus and with Red Rooster. Um, I grew up in Chicago and my dad is from Mississippi. So when Marcus, when I was working for him, was actually around the time that he was fomenting the idea for this book, which became mm -hmm. The Rise, and the conversations then were kind of about the migration, kind of about how that was going to take shape. And I was so enamored just by the whole idea. And it was so cool to see that come to life in this version of this beautiful book, The Rise. And it highlights so many different chefs of color also paying you know, honoring and paying tribute to the chefs of the past and the family food ways that we all came from. Um, and so, you know, as Marcus said, you know, there's, there's kind of a finesse that you have to have in kitchens yeah. and a dance background just helps you move in tight spaces around sharp <laughs> and fire. <laughs> And with a little bit of elegance, especially in an open kitchen like Red Rooster, you don't want to be seen as like flailing behind the line. Um, so the dish that I'm doing tonight is kind of an homage to Marcus and my time at Red Rooster also in a way, um, because there was where I really learned to pull all these global flavors together and really hone them in through your lens. And that's what I do through the Sunday Best Pop-Up. Um, it's also deceptively simple because Marcus likes to smack you in the face with flavor and acid and herbs and everything. And it's such these beautiful dishes that come together. So mine is kind of an homage to that, um, taking humble ingredients and things that you see every day, but just kind of putting them in a new light to give them a new lens and a new appreciation um, that hopefully everybody will enjoy. Great. That's awesome. Oh, and it is, sorry, it is a brioche crusted salmon with a collard green and fennel salad. And the salad is very simply dressed with a nice buttermilk vinaigrette. 
which takes a little finesse to get the buttermilk to uh, emulsify properly, but I know you can do it. <laughs> I know David can, can accomplish that in no time. Fantastic, fantastic. So I think Chef Marcus will be going first with, uh, with his preparation. Great, so um, when I started this today, we are very fortunate. I'm right now at Red Rooster in Overtown in Miami, where we blessed to have incredible art from um, McLean Thomas, Derek Adam, Kara Walker, but also Theasta Gates. And where is Theasta Gates? In the south side of Chicago. Where did Adrian grow up? In the south side of Chicago. So these amazing plates that you're looking at here, they're all crafted by Mr. Theasta Gates. Fantastic. Not only did he did he make them, he came down from Chicago and installed them into the restaurant. We, the, we have a whole room with the Astros plate. They're absolutely amazing. And I said, today is the day when I'm going to bring them out. So, <laughs> nice. You know, it's part with me, but it was also part Adrian. So Great. when we experience food, we can experience it all the same way, but we don't think about it the same way. So think about this. Everyone at home, you know, salt, sweet, sour, bitter, heat, and umami. Those are the six elements of flavor that we can all experience. As chefs, we realize it's probably quicker than the normal, uh, than the average population because this is our job, this is our craft. We experience them all through, through the lens of aesthetic, texture, and fragrance. And all of that's going to be experienced today. So when I start something like this, like a light cured salmon, here's a tip. When you go your, to your fishmonger, you always ask for sushi quality of fish, grade A. Sushi quality of fish, grade A. In a dish like this, you don't need more than three ounces piece of fish because it's so delicious and simple. So I have a beautiful piece of three ounce piece of salmon that I just simply season with salt. That's it. It's the first thing I do. But again, I'm looking at a sushi quality of fish, grade A. Right? So here, I'm just going to salt it, cover it, put it aside. When we talk about texture, this dish is built on texture. So I have a salad that I mixed cucumber and radishes, bitter and water, bitter and water. That's what you get. The cucumber gives you water. The radishes give you bitter. So I'm going to toss that and add a little bit of mushroom. This could be shiitake, it could be any type of salted mushrooms, but just some mushrooms into that. And now, fresh herbs. I have dill, I have cilantro, it could be any fresh herbs. This is just gonna be tossed and dressed with a little bit of olive oil and lemon juice. So, I have to say, yeah. Chef Marcus, it's so painful. The one time I'll probably ever do a cooking demonstration with two of the world's most famous chefs. I've got a screen separating me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we're doing in 2020. Soon, we're 21, we can all be together. So this is a preparation when we can all meet at the Whitney before we go to amazing exhibits and, and look at this. And I have to tell you, coming to this, working on the book, I always look at black excellence in terms of music and in terms of art, right? Because both those cultural segments have really defined it in a great way. And as chefs, we can really learn from that, right? There are eras, right? Like if you talk about American pop culture and you talk about the black experience, everyone knows the difference between gospel, funk, rock and roll, hip hop, and jazz. And if you think about other art forms, like because we valued art and then have started to focus on the value of black art and you have institutions such as the Studio Museum as a hub, and then what comes out of that, that then goes into institutions like the Whitney's, there's many different ways to have a relay and appreciation, right? So Absolutely. The, you think about the generation of the Shee Johnson, Julia Merhert to Kara Walker, they're all are of a place, but then they continue their journey, right? And now the rest of America has a vocabulary for it, 
but also a place um, to purchase and appreciate it. And as chefs, the rise for me was a great place to gather broadcast chefs of color, and hopefully 10 years from now, the same way we talk about the Derek Adams, the Sanford Biggers of the world, maybe we'll, we'll know them and the Theosti Gates, as well as we know the Adrian Cheatham, the Mashama Bailey, the Nina Comptons. Yes. So I'm gonna start, actually start plating this, and I want you to think about plating even at home when you do a dinner party. And, and, Trace, and, and Adrian works with these dinner parties, she's just done fabulously, but you wanna think about the plate as a canvas, so odd numbers, right? I, I always go off center, and I might start with, like in this case, I'm using a little bit of avocado crema, so just smashed avocados. I might use a little bit of creme fraiche or mascarpone, right? So now I have, now I have a focal point. but I'm thinking about my positive and negative spaces constantly. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't play in the center, I play off center, mm -hmm. right? And I work in odd numbers. I work in threes, in fives, in sevens, maybe, if. And chef, is this something you've come to over the years? I mean, I don't think it's something that they teach you in culinary school, right? Like this is a style that you adopt and adapt to? <laughs> It's a good question. You know, I, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, black food, sadly, doesn't ex exist in the culinary schools, in the traditional institutions. Mm -hmm. so one of the blessings about mm -hmm. being black is that you constantly got to find your own way. Mm -hmm. So when I look for food in the black space, I looked at Jean-Michel Basquiat. Mm -hmm. um, because, not because there wasn't black chefs cooking, just because I couldn't find them where I was in Europe. Yeah. So I looked at Jean-Michel as an inspiration and really thinking about aesthetic. Also growing up in Sweden, where aesthetics is everywhere, right? Whether it's in a furniture or in art, so minimalistic design came early. Yes. Um, and honing it probably more at Aquavit. And I feel like Marcus is a little humble. I feel like that artistic nature has always been within him. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing this man and the way he dresses, you know he's got a keen eye and an artistic sensibility that's just innate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. No, but I mean, Red Rooster, when we talked about the design of it, I, I drew it out, right? Because I knew that the architect would not know what I was thinking, right? And I yeah. couldn't articulate it in, especially when you're an immigrant, you think about it in a different language. And although, of course, I can speak English, but when this deep tissue of, of preciseness has to be done, it's easy for me to just draw it out. Yeah. Um, my reference points, it was easier for me to do these collages of reference points because I was so clear on how, like a floor at Red Rooster come from a Senegalese tribe. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no architect in the world that would know that, so I, I drew it out. When I wanted the shape of Red Rooster's bar, I wanted of a very voluptuous woman, right? There's no point of, you can't find that in architecture school. So it's better right. to draw it out. Yeah. So it's just better when I knew that we wanted the art in the back to be about quilts, it's just better to go to Sani, to go to Sanford Biggers and say, hey Sani, I need a favor, you know? So it was, it was just easier that way. That's cool, Chef, do you see yourself as kind of, do you think in texture? Because I know that when we've talked about food, a lot of the descriptors are more textural. It's like you feel what you're seeing. I definitely feel, think about aesthetic and texture as key to the food. And I definitely see it visually first. And then I think about, okay, how does it eat? But, um, and also, I learned a lot from going to, I remember when I worked at Aquavit, just being across the street from MoMA, going in and see a Richter 
um, exhibit, going in and see Rauschenberg, you know, not on a picture, but actually see, uh, you know, all this incredible art that was just across the street. It helped me shape uh, how we wanted to play, actually. Because mm. I wasn't clear in the beginning. I was only 23, 24, so it's like, how do I develop that? That was really where I developed that. Chef, we have one question from, um, from our members, which was uh, if the mushrooms are raw or slightly sauteed. Slightly sauteed. They can also be raw uh, okay. because uh, depending on what, especially shiitakes, if they're going to be raw, I would just toss them in a little bit of salt and soy and letting them sit. Uh, and then you get that beautiful bite to it. Mm. I have some carrots. I just have some very simple carrot juice here. And I use a... It's called ay amarillo, which is a Peruvian chile that is used in Peruvian sort of leche de tigres. And, you know, this is where Adrian talks about the global influences. Here we go. Yep. Here it is. <laughs> she knows me way too well. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like reminiscent of a habanero in the flavor. Yeah, yeah. It's like fruity quality to it and this floral quality that is so beautiful. It's so good, like, because I don't think about, like, it's not that global, but I, all of a sudden we've been to three continents. <laughs> you don't see yourself, you know, you just don't, you know, you just don't. So we get that super nice um, texture uh, of the carrot broth here. And this is also what's going to keep it light, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have carrot, you have avocado, you have salmon, and, you know, for me, this is a light dish, but it's also a dish that has fat, but the fat actually comes from the avocado and, and, and the salmon, right? So it's a fat that it's super enjoyable. It's not a fat that you kind of like think about uh, as in butter or something like that. It's a very light fat that I think makes it so delicious. And of course, I'm just gonna finish with a little bit of olive oil. It's, uh, it's amazing being and listening to the, to the two of you. I feel like I'm doing a studio visit with my colleague, Adrian, uh, during the biennial, because so much of what you're doing is you're working in your craft, but you also are telling a story all the time. And it's you know, what we do at the museum as well. It's what you two are doing in your books, the Rise does so well. You're telling stories. You're like making these things part of people's lives. Um, how does that, come about for the two of you? Like, again, like that's part personality, part just being in, in the world, but does it seem like more and more an important part of your work? Well, I think, I mean, we have similar paths, but also different paths. And for me, being older than Adrian, I have, for me, I feel like I have a different responsibility. We have to pass forward and make it better for the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. And so much about the rise is explaining that black food of course, it's not monolithic, right? Adrian and I share our blackness, but she comes from a mixed family, but she's black. Uh, I come from Africa and have it via Sweden. So obviously her, she has the migration story in her growing up in the Midwest. Blackness is not one thing. And as a black person, we also should be allowed to think about food not from one narrative, right? Like there's some Swedishness in here. There is um, South America in here. And, and, but it's more than anything, it's food, it's excellent and it's delicious. And we shouldn't be pigeonholed just like other art forms should not be pigeonholed. And that's something that I've learned from black artists. When I look at Derek Adams' work, when I look at Julia Merhertha's work, when I look at Mikkeling Thomas, what is it all? It is excellent. Mm -hmm. All of black art, but or Theaster Gates work, it's all different. And it's the same with food. Adrian and I, we share, but we're also different. And yes. her food is her food. Yes. It's definitely, it's different. And, and like Chef Marcus was saying, like there's some similarities just mm -hmm. because of the way you were brought up and the environments that you were in. And whether you're in East Africa or on the South side of Chicago, there are certain things that bind you together in terms of upbringing and characteristics. 
Um, but at the end of the day, we're different, but our food is going to be different as we are and diverse mm -hmm. as we are. Um, but it has to be delicious. It has mm -hmm. to be interesting. It has to be something you want to eat. So you don't want to get too cerebral and yeah. forget about at the end of the day, somebody is going to eat this. Right. <laughs> place thing, yeah. Somebody is going to destroy it and eat it. And that's kind of the beauty of it, where <laughs> some of the beauty of art is when artists show you that, yes, this is here now, but it will not be here forever. Yeah. You appreciate the beauty and the art when it's there. And then you dig right in and you take that first bite and you get those textures and those bright flavors. Um, and it's so cool to see, like, I always joke and say, like, I'm black, but my mother's not uh, because my mother is from the north side of Chicago. But she was very aware that I would be viewed as a black Beautiful. woman. Hmm. And she raised me in restaurants to say, don't think of yourself as different because other people will see you as different enough. So focus on what you want to focus on. Learn the food that you want to learn. Hmm. Don't just do the things that people are telling you to do. Yeah. If you want to learn ramen, go work in Japan. If you want to learn how to ferment and make gochujang, go find somewhere in Korea to go. Mm. And it's that global perspective that I was so glad I was, you know, opened up to as a kid because there's nothing that I won't try or eat or, or incorporate into my food, which comes from a very lens of, even though my mother was white, she cooked Southern food for my dad from Mississippi but she would do her versions of it, her nice. German Catholic, German Jewish, Irish Catholic upbringing into her Southern food that she made. Um, and one of the things that she did is actually- How beautiful is that? I mean, for me, that is, I mean, what you were talking, what you just said, that is why I came to America. That's why I love America so much. Everything you just said, it's like people who struggle with understanding identity, culture, and race, that that looks like your PhD. You're like, I love that. Yeah. I, I also wanted before um, we go to Chef Adrian's dish, if it's okay, I wanted to talk about an exhibition that we have up on yes. the Whitney right now as a way to bring it, some of these ideas together. We have this great show that's up until the end of March called Working Together, the Photographers of the Kamonge Workshop. Yeah. And Kamonge is a word uh, from the Kikuyu people of Kenya that means people acting together. These are 14 incredible black photographers working throughout New York, predominantly um, in, in Harlem though, led by a great artist like Louis Draper, who really kind of instilled a work ethic, was a mentor, was a visionary, but a group of younger artists as well, who had their own thing, had their own style, had their own way of being in the world, including Ming Smith. Um, this is a great picture by Louis Draper that's up. Uh, of Miles Davis, but Ming Smith of Sun Ra taken in, uh, in uh, New York City. Um, other artists, including um, uh, Sean Walker with Easter Sunday Harlem, which is this great uh, photograph, a lot of street work, but a lot of work that's dealing with community um, and place and the texture of place. So I wondered if, um, and you know, one of the big things was they wanted to take photographs of how they wanted to be seen, not how the artists were, saw themselves or their community being properly depicted. I wonder if the two of you could talk about, it's all through your conversation, it's all through the rise, but what community means to you, what working together in one restaurant means together where you have different visions, but how you articulate that difference um, kind of as, as, a, as a collaboration. Well, I, first of all, I love that, uh, that exhibit is up and Ming Smith was part of opening Red Rooster. We, there was, we've worked with Ming forever and she's an icon. I'm so glad that the rest of the, the, the big part of the world now, her work is traveling all over the world. There was actually a Ming Smith exhibit in Stockholm um, about six pre-pandemic and this just shows how her world, her work is, is so important. And, you know, I know in a couple of months, you're gonna have Dawood Bay, that is an amazing photographer out of Chicago, but yes. you, you know, used to be in, in Harlem a lot. And I say this because between two, I moved to Harlem in 2002. And between 2002 and 2010, I studied Harlem just because I'm black, doesn't know, I know blackness in Harlem and the culture and I had to study mm -hmm. it. And I did it through the artists. So Dawood Bay was the person that I spoke to often and 
His books was amazing to me. So art really guided me. Places like the Schomburg I could go to and find libraries of New York libraries of, of menus that were in Harlem, right? And of course, Gordon Park, right? So there was all this wealth and the Smith brothers, all this wealth of culture. And that shaped me to open the restaurant. So once it came to the restaurant in terms of menu and in terms of aesthetic, for me is what set. Because if you study Harlem, East Harlem, there used to be a Finnish Harlem. Well, guess what? I'm from Scandinavia. There used to be Jewish Harlem and, of course, Italian Harlem. And now when we start talk about El Barrio, which is the Spanish Harlem, which was predominantly Puerto Rican, Dominican, and then eventually now Mexican, right? So there's your wave of immigrants. Yes. Then you have the traditional African-American Harlem. Right, and then to the west of that, you have the West African Harlem. So for me, the culture and the history sets the tone of what Red Rooster should be. And then it's just our job to plug in the music, the people, mm. the art, and the food, of course. Mm. But so, so our higher mission is that, that's the first time I worked in a restaurant, we, we, we set out the restaurant to do it that way. Uh, but it kind of gives you this higher high line on the structure how to work on. And, you know, it's very different than, for example, how Adrian does her Sunday best. Yes. I think that's a great setup for Chef Adrian and, and her preparation. Yes, and that's one of the things that I love most about Harlem is coming from Chicago, there are all these ethnicities and all these neighborhoods that have strong identities and these cultural ties, but they're very segregated. So you don't really see that mixing of culture like you do in Harlem. So one of the first things that I noticed about Harlem was it reminded me of Chicago. People made mm -hmm. eye contact on the street. You don't <laughs> run in your front door to avoid contact with your neighbor. You actually hold the door and yeah. wait to say hello to your neighbor. You make eye mm -hmm. contact. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful community vibe that after living in Brooklyn for a couple of years, and I moved to Harlem in 2007, and mm -hmm. I did it for two years before that when I got to Harlem I got off of the train and there was a guy doing chin-ups on a street light <laughs> yep. like he's just, still there he's still there you know he is I'm <laughs> home <laughs> I feel like I just stepped out into a naughty by nature video yeah awesome. I felt yeah, like and this was just before um Red Rooster opened and I used to sit at the restaurant Chez Lucien next door and peek in the door during construction to see what was going on in this new space yeah. What's gonna yeah. open? And it was so cool because in Harlem, unlike Chicago being so segregated, the you have the pockets of these different cultures, but the edges of those bleed into one another. Mm -hmm. So you have the Puerto Rican and Mexican yeah. and the restaurants and stores that they all share in between. And you have Senegalese and you have mm -hmm. African American, but it bleeds into each other. You can get your halal meat right next to the place that you get hair weave. Um, so it was like, <laughs> it was this beautiful blend of culture yeah. and everyone was all in this together. And it was the first time I felt that way, black, white, Hispanic, whatever. We were all part of this beautiful neighborhood. And, uh, so I'm going to get started on this. So this is the salmon. And if you see here, it's a brioche crust, but literally all you do is cut the salmon right along the edges. I should note that people should pay attention because this is not yeah. in the book. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then you literally have your brioche crust. You don't need to brush egg white yeah. or anything. The albumin and the protein from the salmon will stick it together. And I have that going right here in a saute pan. This is just a nice. little uh, extra virgin olive oil. Mm. Think of it like a grilled cheese. You just want to toast that <laughs> bread. And, and Chef Adrian, is this a preparation that you can do with other fish or? Yes, you can do it with yeah. snapper. You can do it with pretty much any fish, Arctic char, anything. And one of the jokes that when my mother was first learning how to make Southern food, um, my great grandmother, my great aunt, actually two of my great aunts uh, drove up from Mississippi and they packed <laughs> cases, they packed cast iron skillets. My parents were just not married, but these three women spent three months with a newly married couple 
to teach my mother how to cook everything. Oh, wow. so they planted a garden in the backyard. They brought seeds and cast iron skillets. And the first thing they asked my mother after their road trip was, okay, let's get started. What do you know how to make that's Southern? My mom says, well, I don't know. Tell me something Southern and I'll tell you if I know how to make it. They said, okay, well, greens. Do you know how to make greens? My mom is like, of course I know how to make greens. So, okay, Susan, you start the greens. We'll start the rest of dinner. So my mother, 10 minutes, she's like, okay, I'm done. The greens are ready. They're like, <laughs> greens ready in 10 minutes. So my mother said, we have a salad. Those are our greens. Oh my God, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a great story. <laughs> we made a romaine and whatever else salad. Uh, this was, we lived near the University of Chicago. So there used yep. to be farmer's market in that Midway area that you could go to. So she had a beautiful salad and she's like, okay, the greens are ready. So that is always the joke in our family. Oh my God, that's and a great story. Mother, it also led me to thinking about greens in a different way. Like, why can't they be raw? Mm, my grandmother yeah. would put kale in her pot of greens. Kale, turnip greens, uh, collard greens and mustard greens. Those were like the four. So as kale started to become popular, I was kind of like, I felt some kind of way, I'm not gonna lie. I was a little offended that kale became the breakout star of the, <laughs> of the but collards were kind of left behind, yeah. although yeah. they were the, to me, the better one. It was mm -hmm. like Diana Ross leaving the other Supremes behind. Yeah, <laughs> Mary, Mary, Mary. <laughs> yeah. So, I love making collard green salads because it's just another way to highlight an ingredient that we're all so familiar with. And it's used in South America, uh, Portugal, Brazil. You see it in, um, in Southeast Asian countries and in Indian cultures and Punjabi food as well. So mm -hmm. collard greens are used all around the world. Yes. For some reason, when it comes to eating them raw, we're all a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. So what I usually do is I just, I cut them very thinly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Pick up the stem and give them a little like thin julienne. Um, and then you just want to squeeze a little lemon juice over them. Sprinkle them with a little bit of salt. And you kind of want to get in there. Like you kind of want to mm -hmm. massage your greens. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid. Um, yeah. But you'll see them start to get a little darker green. You'll see them start to get a little shiny looking. Um, and that's when you know it's working. The acid and the salt are getting into the leaves and it's gonna start to tenderize it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to cook it. You can let the acid do the hard work for you. And then you have all the vitamins, all the nutrients. I mean, dark leafy greens are some of the healthiest things you can eat. And when we cook them, if you're not drinking the pot liquor, you're losing out on all of that health benefit, all the, all the vitamins, all the minerals. And this way you get everything. So I'm just massaging them a little bit here. And you can see they're starting to wilt a little bit and get a little bit darker in color, mm -hmm. but not much. I'm just that. kind of giving them a oh, light yeah. massage. I'm not going like massage parlor, you know, deep tissue here, just kind of a service <laughs> level massage. That's great. And then to go with that, I love to do something crispy and crunchy like fennel. So I have mm -hmm. some fennel that I shaved very thinly on a mandolin and just held it in some ice water. So while the greens are getting tender, the fennel is gonna get crispy, crispy. And then we're gonna add them together with this buttermilk vinaigrette and let them just come together and get that texture crunch from the fennel and that like soft, delicious kind of green from the collards. Mm. Meanwhile, the salmon is getting toasty. So you see here, the bread is already nicely browned, Beautiful. but you see it's sticking to the fish. Beautiful. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just pop this in the oven and that is going to just finish cooking. And in the meantime, you can like go play with your kids. You can pour a glass of wine, you know, go give Zion a hug, chef. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can pour another Mar for myself. Right. Exactly. <laughs> David. And that's the fun thing is like in Harlem. So actually, Marcus and I live on the same street. Okay. So yes. I'm not stalking you, Adrian. I'm not stalking you, Adrian. <laughs> I'm stalking you. <laughs> but this summer, they closed off the streets. Yes. And it became this beautiful place where all the kids and the parents could come out and play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd see Maya. I'd see Zion. I'd see some of the other kids from the neighborhood. Um, and obviously, it's COVID. So you're not going to stop and talk to anybody. But it was just so nice to see that community mm -hmm. feel because it's all different races. 
It's just yeah. everybody who lives in this neighborhood coming mm. together to just enjoy the weather yeah. and the lack of traffic coming down the street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, Adrian, I mean, that's a really interesting point. I think that as a community, we all have to figure out locally uh, how to make the best of the situation. And that blocking off that street was parents coming together and saying, I can cook, I'm a gym teacher, I'm a Spanish teacher, I can do this. So it was literally between 15 parents, there was basically every skill that we needed. And uh, it became such a hub. And um, you know, we, we're gonna see these small wins in communities, right? Where communities have figured it out, neighborhoods have figured it out how to do the best out of the situation. And uh, it was definitely one of the highlights of the summer uh, to, to uh, and hopefully this spring we're gonna continue it. Yeah, yeah, it's been truly amazing. Even my husband and I just like, sometimes we'll go out, you know, we'll like pack a little picnic and kind of sit yeah. on the sidewalk because it's one of the few places in a city as bustling as New York that you can really do that. Yeah. Chef Adrian, I'm, I'm really interested in, in all the, the pillars in, in the rise. One of them that was really seemed really crucial was around authorship. And it's been mm -hmm. interesting to hear both of you talk so much about locating where an ingredient comes from, claiming things for particular cultures. Um, that seems to be something that's such a, an important way to kind of give credit where it's due. Um, how does that kind of go into uh, the work you're doing, even the, the book that you're working on now? Well, I think we miss so many opportunities when we don't acknowledge where something comes from. And, you know, that's something that not a lot of chefs do, but that's something that Chef Marcus was very adamant about, was saying where this came from, where did this idea come on? One time we did an interview together and I was giving him credit for a dish because he was the impetus behind it. He said, I want to create a savory macaron, go ahead. And so on the radio show, I was, you know, giving him the credit for it. And he was like, don't do that. He was like, yes, I may have given you the idea, but you created the dish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's different for a chef to say, you get the credit for this. And that got me thinking, you know, that's all these ingredients come from somewhere. Aji Amarillo is something like chef said is in, in Peru and it's used frequently. So how can somebody just not acknowledge that? You miss out on opening up the conversation to that entire mm -hmm. culture and that entire country and the beautiful food and culture that they have there by not acknowledging it. So it, it's really important, you know, to really say um, this person created this and that was important for photographers like Gordon Parks. That was, yeah. you know, a piece of art that I was so like, that was something that I wanted to have was a piece from his segregation series. Mm -hmm. yeah. His photography for years. And I started learning about him because I found out that he was one of the first high fashion photographers. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, that was a black photographer yeah. who created these images and the blurred woman walking through an, a cold, austere office in this beautiful gown. And yes. she's like stepping over a desk and you're like, whoa, I, I, I had never conceived of a black high fashion photographer until learning about that. And it's the same yeah. thing, if you don't give that credit, you don't open up that conversation and include everybody that should be included. Absolutely, I mean, it's so interesting to think about artists who are always remixing and reimagining, but it's also so important to locate what you're, re what you're reimagining, <laughs> what you're remixing. So you kind of build on what's done before, not pretend like it didn't happen, but build on that conversation. But, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna even gonna build on what Adrian just said, right? Because it's a really important thing. So in same generation as Gordon Park was the Smith brothers, right? These African-American photographers that shot, they could not get, if you go back and look at old black images or old images, very often it says photographer unknown. Yeah. Because you were not allowed to credit a black photographer. Yeah. Think, just think about that concept, like, yeah. right? That's crazy. So the, the Smith brothers were the, like, the, they just, they died about 15 years ago, two twins. And they had to go to Europe, which a lot of, of course, black artists had to do uh, to get work. So they worked for Vogue, they worked for amazing magazines across, and then came back home and eventually got credited. But for the majority of their lifetime working, 
that it was they did not get credited for the work. Yeah. So when I think about why is there confusion about why don't we appreciate Southern black food the way we appreciate Southern Italian food? Yeah. Why don't we appreciate, let's say, why don't we know about low country in the Carolinas the way we know about Bordeaux? Of course, it's linked to racism. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's so simple and basic. And all these isms just got to go because it's, it's, it's not productive. And mm. our, that's why it's so important what the Whitney does and the cultural institutions in New York does because it brings people together and we need to reimagine because I don't relate to American history because it wasn't written of, by me, it was uh, by us, and it wasn't written with us in mind, right? Mm. I know we have a history, but it's not acknowledged, right? So that's why I say as a democratic, we're a young country. Black people didn't get the voting right until 1965. So I yeah. just look at it as a whole country. We have not been whole since 1965, which probably makes us one of the youngest countries in the world. Yeah. And when you see the issues we're going through, we act like one of the youngest countries in the world. Yeah. So um, I think it's such an important thing about mm -hmm. authorship, because once you understand authorship, you can now have memories. Yes. And after memories, you can now have aspiration, right? We don't, we just didn't fall in love with, let's say, Italy, right? It happened in layers, right? We knew about the history, and it was amazing about the Romans. Well, at the same time, the Egyptians and Ethiopians were doing similar things. Maybe not as amazing, but we focus on the Romans. Yeah. After that comes, let's tourist to those places. Well, why don't we tourist to Detroit and to Charlotte and to... New Orleans, for example, right? Yep. And after that comes desperation of experiencing that. So when we constantly put down our institutions, our places, and write about other places, no one has value in this whole thing. So for me, this is the moment, actually. This is the most important reset button that we can do as a collective. And it's the biggest gift we can do for the next generation to actually acknowledge we have an opportunity to restart and let's do it in a much more inclusive way. Yes. And I know as people, we will have a much more delicious, inclusive, cultural and delicious conversation. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. Chef Adrian, we had a question from one of our members about the, um, the, the temperature of the oven um, and the cook time. So I cooked the salmon, I popped it into a 375 degree oven. Um, you can blast the oven and get a nice cook on the outside and have it rare in the middle, but you really start to get that fat from the salmon kind of going. If you do something like salted, you kind of like tighten up the protein structure or if you cook it at a low temperature like this, it kind of brings out all that flavor and keeps it nice and juicy. So I did mm. 375 after toasting just for about five to seven minutes. And I just actually took that out of the oven. The reveal, wow. Nice. You see it's nicely cooked on the outside. It's the opaque pink. And then on the center, can't really see it, but it's got that little dark rare color. You got an art crowd, we can imagine it. <laughs> yeah, so picture <laughs> Marcus's salmon just nestled inside of here. So I you'll love have it. that yeah. stunning. Stunning. And, you know, plating, obviously, we eat with our eyes first. Yeah. So I love garnish. I'm a huge fan of garnish. Um, I love using free garnish, especially. So the inside of celery hearts, the leaves that you get from there, gorgeous. And they make things light and fluffy. And they're free because you already mm -hmm. paid for the celery. Same <laughs> thing with fennel. I love getting the fronds from the fennel here. Yeah. Why not echo something that's already in the salad? So I'm just gonna pick some of this. I have some dill in the vinaigrette. If you have dill left over, you can do that as well. You just wanna make it light and bright and airy. The buttermilk vinaigrette brings a nice tang to it. So you have the richness of the salmon. You have this bright, beautiful vinaigrette with a little acid on the collard greens. And it just really brings it all together. So you just want to keep that light look on it with the fennel fronds. And mm, you know, it really always helps. It really breaks things mm. up. So this Fantastic. is our finished dish. 
Fantastic. So there's the collard green salad on the one side. Beautiful. Beautiful. Little vinaigrette on the bottom because you want to keep that flavor and that moisture. Yeah. And then just a little fennel frond, you know, just a little playful garnish there. Looks great. This is like torture, Chef Adrian. Sort of <laughs> crawl into my screen. <laughs> Thank you. We're all cooking in person, but this is the new generation. This is great. Uh, yeah. This is great. This is great. Um, before we open it up for a few questions for, uh, for our members, I wanted to ask one. I wanted to kind of bring it together with uh, another Harlemite and a good friend of, I know, Marcus, who's Julie Moretto, because yeah. we have her great uh, retrospective show that's opening on March 25th. Uh, it's a collaboration with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, co-curated by our great Rue Hockley at the Whitney. And what's amazing to me about uh, Julie's work is they're unabashedly abstract, right? Like she wants it to be uh, in some ways difficult, opaque, but it's always based on histories, real stuff. Her childhood in Ethiopia, political movements, African liberation, but there's this way where you go from the very abstract to the real. And I wanted to ask the two of you because in your world, and in the what you do in your food, you start from what's very real, but it's also kind of abstract. <laughs> you know, it's about feelings and mood and memory. And this might be kind of a weird question, but does that does that resonate with you? This relationship to abstraction, um, this kind of pull of wanting to kind of be in between things. And if so, I, I think uh, our, I would, and I think our members would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean. Julie and I, we, we were neighbors forever, but we came up in New York at the same time. And we happened, you know, she has an Ethiopian background and a Midwestern background as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, Julie's a genius, like a true, true genius. She operates on a completely different level, right? And to watch and be close to someone like that, when she ta start talking about her ideas for the painting, where she ends up, it, it is, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. The layers, maybe there's six layers, seven layers, and you know, and it's very clear to her. And when you see her, you know, when she invites me maybe to the studio after a couple of months, I'm always blown away. And this has happened since like 95, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I've yeah. watched it, <laughs> right? But, I feel very often as a creative, I have a very hard time articulate what it is, but I have not a hard time articulating on the plate, yeah. right? Yeah. So that is, you know, 80% of most communication is really done through other mediums, right? And I wish for certain politicians that we would narrow that down to 99%. That might be <laughs> in the next time. But anyway, we move on. Uh, no, but I do mean that as creatives, it is easier for us to close our eyes and cook this, right? If I would explain to you, but in my head, it's so clear that the carrot matches the orange of the salmon. The brightness of the bitter radishes matches the lightness of the uh, cucumber. And the shiitake gives you that umami flavor. Now, if I would talk about that, you just, you sound crazy. So it's like, for me, it's just much better to do Sounds it. Sounds like poetry to me, Chef. Yeah, it's just good <laughs> to do it. So, so uh, but I, I really feel like blessed to be able to, A, had mentors that saw something in me and sent me out to the world to go to Japan as an 18 year old, to go to Singapore as a 22 year old, and live in France and live in Switzerland and slowly build of, of becoming, right? So when I got into New York, I felt like I know how to build food. I know what my food's gonna look like. And it took me basically the whole 90s to really figure that part of me out. And to have an audience to, the most appreciated things you can do as a creative is to have two types of audience. The audience of staff, that wants to work with you, which is very challenging yeah. at times. <laughs> and then the audience of the public that supports you, right? We can also be challenging at times. So 
as a creative being in the middle of that, I just feel it's a huge love letter uh, to be part of that. And then to see then people, young chefs like Adrian to come up and be so clear in her identity, be so clear yeah. in what she's gonna do. And she will do it. This book she's gonna come out, come out with will be amazing. I'm telling you, it will be amazing. And you know, it's like an artist coming out with their first own show. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah. things make sense in your head. Yeah. And then you have to translate that into reality. And, you know, it's, it's kind of that abstract process. You know, you mm. talk about a dish, you think about it. Sometimes it's just the inspiration of a piece of art you see or an outfit mm. that you wear that you're like, oh, these colors go great together. So mm. what about the blue of this and the fuchsia of this radish? Like, you know, it'll come together because it works in another realm but it's still a very abstract idea that you have to turn into a reality. And that's the beautiful, fun part of it is you can be looking at a painting or a photography or you know a photograph and really say that works there. I know how to translate that idea into flavor and texture and something that somebody will wanna eat. Fantastic. Um, I have one, we're gonna field a few questions now, if that's, if that's cool with the two of you. Um, I have one, um, do Chef Adrian and Chef Marcus have recommendations for wine pairings with their dishes? Go ahead, Adrian. So for this one, I actually really like a dry Riesling, mm. um, like a super dry tart. You know, it's got, I hate to sound cliche, but you know, some of the stereotypes of Scandinavian food are mm -hmm. that you have salmon and dill. Well, here mm -hmm. you go. I have salmon and dill in the same thing. <laughs> albeit with buttermilk and collard greens. Um, but you know, if, if you're up in the Alsatian region, they know their dry wines and they know mm -hmm. what it goes well with. And it can go with a fatty meat or a fatty fish like salmon. So I really like something like that, or maybe mm -hmm. even a Sancerre if you want to go a little richer. Mm -hmm. uh, the brioche can still give you some of that buttery richness that will offset that. Um, but I, I do, you know, between those two, I might yeah. go buy Riesling. Sounds well, great. a trim bike would be amazing. A chill yeah. trim bike would be amazing. But I would say on my dish, um, Adrian and I are dear friends with this amazing woman as an icon in hospitality, Rita Jame. And Rita has, this, she used to have the most iconic restaurant in New York for many years, La Caravelle. And then she converted to that into champagne. And her, um, why not try one of our rosé champagnes with this mm -hmm. cured fish? It's very, it's light, it's festive. And when you think about champagne, it's always in a festive occasion. So I think uh, we would go with La Caravelle. Clearly biased that Le Rita also happened to live in Harlem. So this is an all Harlem <laughs> event, by the way. That's great. <laughs> Can we also just go back and acknowledge the sitcom of that poor young, Irish white mother with those three black aunties telling her how to cook black food. That's a sitcom by itself, by the way. <laughs> Can we just, I, I had that image in my head. I was like, this is amazing. The TV <laughs> deal <laughs> coming. Yeah. So I have another, this is, I think, a really great question. Um, how do you think we can engage children in this process of expanding cultural storytelling, particularly with food? Yeah. That's for well, Chef Marcus. Yeah, <laughs> I <cold>. mean, <laughs> my son cooks with me every day, every morning, but it does not mean that he eats good, right? <laughs> so cracking an egg and being a boy is like fun and lots of them. Opening up, uh, like, let's say, a tomato where the seeds are different than the outside. So all of these things that what's beautiful about vegetables and fruits is it's like, it's one thing on the outside and another thing on the inside. And he gets so excited if I bring home a watermelon radish and it's completely different, for example. And he likes the texture of, let's say, a cucumber or something like that, or a watermelon that looks so different in the summertime, green or yellow inside, right or red inside. So I, we try to do a lot of sensory cook with him. But in terms of eating, not good <laughs> results. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I think I, I have, I'm getting the questions through text. So I got three little dots percolating. So we'll see if there's another one. Um, I, 
I just want to thank you. I think we'll have a question, but I think also people are dropping off a little. They're getting hungry after seeing this great uh, preparation. I am too. One, <laughs> one thing that's um, I think that we share, we threw on the screen, Adam, everyone who works in museums, is that there's a real, um, a bind with hospitality. And I mean that as a very radical thing. Like we think of strangers as our own. We put ourselves in their feet first. Empathy is so much of the work we do, the storytelling that we do. So I think that's such, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation because it's what I think binds us and helps makes a, you know, a better future for all of the work that we do. Thank you. Well, I think it, if pivot was the word of 2020, I hope um, empathy is the word of 2021. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right, I have one more and then I'll let you go because I know you both have busy schedules. Um, Chef Marcus has been very gracious about sharing some artists who inspired him. And Chef Adrian, are there any artists or dancers that have inspired mm -hmm. you particularly? So Carmen De La Vallada, I love her. Um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank right now because I'm thinking about <laughs> the food I'm cooking. Um, yeah. but, you know, everybody, I mean, I loved the dance styles of Dorothy Dandridge and Eartha Kitt, mm. you know, cause they were crossover. They took dance as a platform to propel them into other things. And they use that movement and the techniques that they learned there to apply to different areas of their lives. Um, modern day, obviously who's not inspired by Misty Copeland. I mean, mm. come on. If, if I hadn't been deterred by my ballet teacher telling me that my thighs were too big, I might <laughs> stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was told, like a lot of people, you don't really have the body type for ballet. Um, so I really admire that she took, she, and I mean, yes. what kind of body type does she have that's not right for ballet? I mean, the woman yeah. is like clearly made to dance. Um, mm -hmm. So I really admire her fortitude and her work ethic and sticking with it um, and everything she's been able to accomplish and aspire other, inspire other people um, outside of dance as well as within. Yeah. Um, you know, those are some of some of the biggest inspirations that I carry in terms of dance. Um, Josephine Baker, you know, she was just a force to yeah, be mm -hmm. reckoned with, but you could mm -hmm. not reckon with her. Um, <laughs> you know, to being a spy for, for the French during the war, um, you know, to be buried with honors from yeah. the French military as a black woman during that time is incredible. The things that a lot of these women, especially during that time, that's why I always hearken back to that time period between the late 40s to mid 50s, um, because the things that they were able to accomplish in spite of the discrimination at home, and as Chef Marcus said, most artists had to go to Europe, um, you know, it just, it really makes you want to keep going, because if they can overcome that, there's really nothing going on today that can really touch those controversies there. Mm. Wow. I think I think that's such a powerful way to uh, conclude this evening. I want to thank Chef Marcus, Chef Adrian for being such generous collaborators. We look forward to having more of the rise. We look forward to having Chef Adrian's book coming soon. Yes, I want, we're going to do it at the Whitney with Adrian when she you launches heard, it. You that heard it here first. She told me, <laughs> I'm not doing this unless you're doing my book. And I was like, well, I will speak to Adam and David, but I'm sure it, go. it's public but, now. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, my dear colleagues at the Whitney who helped put this on, Chef Marcus's great team who helped put this thank on, you. and to our members for making all this possible. So thanks all of you. We look forward to seeing you in real life at some point soon. And please place, be safe and stay well. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, Adrian. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye.